Hey everyone, it's Bailey Elizabeth here. I'm really excited to be bringing you the first episode of my monthly to bi-monthly interview series titled A Conversation With, where I'll be speaking with artists of all kinds and organizations who have found themselves at this intersection of art and life. My first guest is someone who's so special and important to me and someone who I wouldn't have wanted to kick off this interview series without. He is a 20-year music business veteran, touring as both a solo artist and with his band, The Sixers. He's played over 2,000 concerts, written, uh, recorded 17 albums, written hits with Robert Randolph and OIR, and shared the stage with Jason Isbell, Counting Crows, Train, Sarah Bareilles, OIR, Matt Nathanson, and Andrew McMahon, to name a few. He's also an author, a speaker, and maybe most important, a family man. It is my pleasure to bring you my friend and the man that, man that Rolling Stone referred to as John Prine fronting the Heartbreakers, one of the best lyricists of his generation, Stephen Kellogg. The thing that nobody tells you, you figure it out if you can. There's some things that you never get over, that build a character of a man. And if heaven and family and children What's left of me when I die? Now, oh, for your sakes, you're all better than me. I'm just learning to we say goodbye. We had no idea just how long it would be. But you never know, you never know when the last time you're going to see a friend is. Let the people you love know you love them. And know that if you're keeping score, this guy here believes we will all be together again. Twist and I shout, gravity, you're breaking me down, breaking me down, till I twist in my shout, yeah. We look back through the looking glass, visions closer than they appear. So many things to be grateful for, all these objects in the mirror, yeah. And you gotta give those children roots and wings, never fear the change of brain. To be so sad, be thankful for the time Buddy, how are you? Pretty good. Oh, I got to turn my sound up. There we go. There you go. Okay. How's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Doing great. Doing Just great. to tell you like a little bit more about the blog, it's focusing on how art, you know, obviously how art intersects with life, but how life impacts art and art impacts life. And in mm -hmm. how a lot of ways they can mimic each other, you know, art can mimic what's going on in the world around us. I really want to, you know, for this interview series, just, you know, introduce the world to really awesome artists and ones who I think can really, can really grasp onto that idea of art and life intersecting. Yeah, so, 100%. When you hear the saying, the intersection of art and life, what do you think of and what does that mean to you? Cool. Uh, I mean, you know, first of all, I, th I think the whole idea of, of a blog on the way these two facets of, of life 
intersect. I think it's a great idea, Bailey. So it's, well, I, I mean, to you. me, it just makes me excited because I think, you know, that my my art has been such a big part of my life mm -hmm. and it has gotten increasingly clear to me that you really can't pull the two things apart you mm -hmm. know they're just like um they're so inexorably intertwined mm -hmm. you know and so talking about that and sort of realizing that and accepting that as part of what what we have because sometimes i think there's this tendency as artists to go like okay i'm gonna set down my art right now because i really need to deal with my life mm -hmm. when when in fact like it's almost like the exact opposite is necessary yeah. it's like it's all happening you can't stop the roller coaster you yeah. know you know i mean as you as you know from through your photography and absolutely and, 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 well and i think this goes into something I was going to ask you later, but this this ties in with what you were just saying. You know, I I know I've struggled in the past at, about with you know sharing parts of my life through my art or you know keeping certain opinions to myself because I didn't want to like rock the boat kind of thing. And as I've grown and matured as a person and an artist. I've kind of not been able to hold that back within my work and in my life. And so I know for me, I have a lot of people that I'm Facebook friends with that are, you know, business people. And so when the 2016 election was going on, I didn't say anything about it on my Facebook. I didn't talk about who I was voting for, nothing, because I was worried that I was going to, you know, piss off people that might give me work. And the night of the election, I was like, screw it. I'm not keeping quiet anymore. And I went for it. And I've been extremely outspoken ever since. And so I just, I decided the benefits of, of speaking on that outweighed the risk of losing people. And if the people, those people are just terrible anyway, if they don't want to listen to it. But how, I, this year you've really opened up about, you know, certain like politics, equality, subjects that you usually haven't you know touched on in the past and mm -hmm. as an as an artist you know it does risk alienating fans was that an easy decision for you to to start talking about that or did you wrestle with it well you know i mean it's a good question i it's kind of so much of of my life there was less um there were things were less, the sharks weren't as close to the mm -hmm. boat, you know? Yeah. So, so there wasn't a, a necessarily a pressing need. Mm -hmm. uh, growing up as a kid, we never no, we never talked politics at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, like I never, rem I don't remember having a single conversation before the age of 18 mm -hmm. with anybody about anything political. It yeah. was like, it was something we sort of learned later. Mm -hmm. Um, which I realize, you know, it, it's also there's that's a luxury, you know, for, that was a luxury or a privilege for me to not have to be thinking about politics. Right. But, it, you know, as as things have have really I but I've always had a strong sense of right, what's right and what's wrong. And, and, and my wife calls me minor injustice man because little injustices I take yeah. very personally, you yeah. know, I, I just take, I don't, so we've had major injustices, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, just gross it, suddenly to, to sort of be vague about Nazis and things like that. Yeah. Like you can't, there, it's, that's, there's not really an option to not have an opinion about that. And if you have an opinion that is kind of condones, like, well, it's okay. And if the, the Nazis, like, you're wrong. I mean, it's like, you can't, yeah. you can't say, well, my opinion is that slavery was right. Right. right? There is right and there's wrong. And it's not, yeah, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but some opinions are just wrong, you yeah. know? Absolutely. So, so it became kind of like, but I, the one thing that has also kind of kept me out of some of the dialogues is that a tremendous amount of energy gets spent. Mm -hmm. uh, just shouting into an echo chamber, you yeah. know, and that is across, 
that is across both sides. And we're just like this. Yeah, it's just everybody regurgitating everybody yeah. else's ideas. And I sometimes feel like, boy, I don't because I know I will respond to every tweet and everything. Mm -hmm. like, I'm just kind of like, is this the most productive, useful, helpful right. thing I can do in our world? It's not that I'm sticking my head in the sand. It's just like, right. can I write a song about this? Can I give do some charity work? Is there something else I can do that's going to be more supportive than me fighting with someone on Twitter? Absolutely. You no, know? and that's where I still speak up. You know, when I think I can move the needle. Right. I, that, uh, the one other thing I would say is like leading up to the election. I felt very strongly, regardless of political affiliation, that Donald Trump was a very toxic yeah. force in our in our United States. And anything he might have done good politically was outweighed by his incredibly toxic Absolutely. narcissistic personality. Yeah. So I had a sign on my lawn that said Republicans for Biden. And mm -hmm. I got a bunch I took there was a picture of it and I got all this Yeah. I got a lot of shit from people who I completely agree with on the other side, like, how could you be a Republican? It's like, this is the sort of, this is, that's kind of a douchey expenditure of their energy to just yeah. take aim. And my point there was I wanted to give the Republicans that I knew who were, who just had, who different values, but didn't, weren't necessarily Trump people. I wanted right. to offer some permission to have right. those political because that seemed more productive. Yes. But it was exhausting to sit there arguing oh, with yeah. people on Twitter defending, no, I'm a Democrat, but it's like, I shouldn't have to do that. But it's like, Absolutely. you know. Yeah. So it was and tricky. I mean, you know. It, it really is. And I, I think, you know, in terms of what you said, you know, Republicans, you know, give them permission. I think there were a lot of moderates who didn't like Trump, but they felt like they couldn't go against party or what kind of thing. So yeah, that's just finding a way for yourself to advocate or, you know, make a difference. It's just, you know, that's really cool. And, and I know with, uh, I've had enough, the song you wrote, I think that did a fabulous job of kind of getting your opinion across while not being one of these protest songs that is super angry or, you know, really attacking someone it was it was speaking out but in a beautiful way with integrity and morals and not ripping someone else apart like you know well thank you and, and i should qualify too i because i had i i have a lot of anger i mean everything i wrote for like a year just was so drenched with my own anger about what was happening and so I, I was talking with it with my friend, Eric Donnelly from yeah. the alternate roots, who you know as well. And he and I wrote, I've had enough together. And he is so much was, you know, with him, he was always saying, is there a way we can say these same things that doesn't, not to shy away from it, but just that right. doesn't close the door on the faces of people with whom we might actually connect. It's like right. when you can connect with someone yeah. do it and if you have to let it go if something's too toxic then it goes but but there is still good possibility for connection yeah that being lost right now in the in the deep divide and and that song largely through eric's influence that's what we were aiming at so i'm yeah. glad to hear you say that that's how it read for you yeah you, know? you, you definitely achieved that with that because you you want to try and reach those people and change their minds. And some people are very stuck in their ways, but others, if you approach it the right way, you may actually have an impact on their, you know, um, on their opinions. And so I, well, I totally get that too. I mean, and that, I, that's what I would so much prefer. I would rather impact 10 people yeah. than grandstand in front of a thousand. Like, Absolutely. and just play like, me, man, man, this is what I think. It's like, yeah. can I grab these? And it's so you end up sort of sometimes dealing with smaller realms or, you know, I've had a few people telling me they were disappointed I wasn't saying more. And I'm like, mm -hmm. if we all worry about ourselves for just a minute, yeah. you know, like I'm not, I, I like everybody, I was sort of finding my way through right. and half the things if I said them, I mean, if you don't, if you haven't thought a thought out and you just 
spewing. It's like, yeah. it just leads to absolutely to more trouble, you know? So yeah. it's, yeah. And, you know, during the experience tour, you had quite a few very passionate, you know, moments where you spoke about it and that were very powerful, um, which. Yeah, I know you were tuned in for one and that, that, that one, that was hard, you know, cause yeah. I, 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 but it, it's just, then it, then, then you're not making, I'm not even making a choice at those points. You're just yeah. emotionally driven Absolutely. moved to like, I can't take yeah. this anymore. I mean, and it's, it is, there were, there's been a lot of that these last few years yeah. where you can't, you, you just shake your head at what, at what things you thought were, you know, there's a, there's a movement afoot where you can say two plus two is five and people will bite into that. And yeah. you're like, this is, this is truly surreal. Absolutely. Much for your opinion of, of human intelligence or compassion, but, yeah. um, I don't know. Then you're called a liberal elite for feeling that way, but you're yeah. like, well, the thing is two plus two just isn't five. <laughs> so if that makes me an elitist to, to just say, no, you're, you're incorrect. And yeah, moving on yeah. from there, I mentioned the experience tour. So I want to talk about that. Um, like moving on from there, let's discuss abortion next and then we'll move to <laughs> capital punishment. Exactly. <laughs> right exactly. Politics with Bailey Rogers. Yeah. No, me just just jump right in with the with the yeah. uh, tough topics yep. um so i think you know i think the experience tour was such an incredible example in many ways of art intersecting with life um you know i know so many of your fans i did i know others who did you know found it therapeutic people were shut in their homes you know they couldn't go do anything and it just got to be a bit much. And I know, you know, tuning in, seeing you do show your shows, you know, just a friendly face to see and listen to music and really feel welcome. I know that was a really big thing with a lot of your fans. Um, is that, I is that part of why you guys uh, extended it so much? You know, why you jumped in to do more and more shows? And was it therapeutic for you? Yes and yes is this is the short <laughs> version. I mean, it, it was uh, we didn't realize how how like real, for lack of a better word, we could make the shows mm -hmm. be. You know, it was like initially we did it out of necessity because right. I had a book tour and we yeah. had ticketed it, and if I had had to, I had invested really heavily right. in some, some of which I never got back. You know. Yeah in the, all these places. So it was like, okay, we had to pivot quickly to right. find a way to, to just keep, you know, from losing our house, yeah. you know, to dramatics, but absolutely. then what happened, what happened was we figured it out. And it was like, when I was talking, because we did the shows live, yeah. we didn't do them pre-taped. Yeah. So it was like, I realized like, oh, this really feels like I'm communicating with people. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting their feedback in real time in the chat yeah. role and on after the shows, people would be posting and writing and in before the shows, we would meet in the meet and greets and mm -hmm. stuff like that. So suddenly what had always felt like, oh, you couldn't do that on a computer. I realized you really, you can, you can yeah. connect deeply and meaningfully. This conversation we're having doesn't feel diminished by not being in the same room right now. Yeah, absolutely. And, and on the flip side of that, you can actually sit with someone and feel like you're miles apart. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Uh, I mean that that so so it really has this this last year and a half has really flipped my whole sense of physical space on its head. You know, mm -hmm. and what it means. So we were doing these shows, and and they were, you know, it felt good to play. It felt it just felt like the greatest part of the day, and and people continued to um you know come and and show up and so uh as time wore on it it be, it really ended up feeling like well of course we're going to do another tour of this mm -hmm. because why would we stop and right now frankly it's it's pretty challenging to go do in-person shows again yeah. because they're actually much weirder 
as they are. I mean, and that will change as yeah. things go on. But I mean, playing, you know, I played one show last week in front of a plexiglass. I, wall. Yeah, I saw that picture. I mean, it's, you yeah. know, it's things are things are different. It's they're yeah. strange out there. And, and so but but this stopped being strange after I did it a few times. Yeah. You know, I felt the people who watching. I knew there yeah. was somebody who's might be having a tough day yeah. who needed me to play well to help their day. Like I, I, I told my wife, I've never felt so useful in my 20 years in the business. Yeah. You know, like I really felt yeah. useful. So I, I know for me, it, it was, it was hugely important and, and just having that and feeling like, you know, music has always been such a huge part of my life. Going to see live music has always been, you know, a huge part of my life. And I had similar to you, you know, I had my whole life pulled out from under me, um, you know, working for so far sounds poof that went out, out of the picture and, you know, every work, work I do with help with my mom, with her business, you know, everything just kind of, it was like vanished in one second and yeah. you don't have any, con and, and we didn't have any control over it. And so just having that to kind of sh give me some hope and see that, you know, music is still there it might be in a different form but live music is still there um and yeah i i think the whole tour in general was very hopeful and i know i think a lot of people felt that i'm i'm glad to hear it and i hope i kind of you know hopefully as we rebuild we can build in some of that you know it's mm -hmm. it won't it won't it'll probably it'll probably you know assuming no pan more pandemics you know and that we've yeah. moved through this one and all but it's like it may never be like it was in may of 2020 right. where i did like 21 of those shows yeah. or something but uh we did one last weekend and it felt so good it was yeah. good like i i would like to always have this be part of what we do because it's yeah it really is special in its own way and you get to reach into areas that you don't can't physically get to maybe but you still get to yeah reach people that need it you always want the bat signal to be up there you know yeah and i know something that i really loved about it which trans which kind of segues into a part of another couple things i was going to ask you you know if it weren't for covid and the experience tour hadn't happened i never would have seen you perform with sophia and adeline on stage with you and i thought it was just so special and you could just feel the connection between you guys. And I know, you know, anyone who knows your music or knows you knows, you know, you are a family man. Family is everything to you. It means so much. And you constantly write about that. You know, it is your main source of inspiration, you know. And now, now when this came about, touring and doing shows wound up being a family affair as well. Whereas you're usually on the road, you know, your wife and kids aren't with you. And here you have the experience tour and Kirsten's running the stream. The girls are getting up on stage with you. You know, how did, talk to me a little bit about that, about, you know, how it, how it felt to have that switch flipped and they weren't just a part of the writing and the songs, but they were a part of the entire production. Yeah. Well, initially I was nervous about it because mm -hmm. I don't, I've always tried to not make Kirsten, I, I, for many years anyway, I just avoided having to involve her in the business side of it mm -hmm. because I guess, you know, I guess I was like a little bit ashamed that I wasn't able to be more successful, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like you go into venues that aren't full or you go, mm -hmm. you know, and, you, and I never wanted her to have to like, it's just, it's sort of, I know it's nothing to be like shame is a heavy word, but it's like for many, many years, I just thought I'm not, I, if I was better, I would have more fans and more money and I would be able to, we wouldn't have to hustle as much as we do, mm. you know, make it work. And I, you know, partially from turning 40 and become, you know, you start to reconfigure your priorities a little bit. And so we started the family store business and she started helping out a lot with that and, and and then was able to kind of like focus 
we we were by by her doing that work we saved money in other places she was able to be home more and all these things so she has gradually been getting more involved as the years wore on but it was always a thing for me like you know and sometimes if something goes wrong on the road like you just it's easier it was always easier to have that be separate yeah and yet once she started being the person on these streams and we both we knew we needed this we weren't going to have anybody else in the house because at that point too we didn't know anything about right. COVID really and you're like I, it's not worth risking anybody's life to yeah so she started doing it and we started having a lot of fun with it and i think that you know that couldn't have been more perfect i mean we really it became our thing. We happen to be a couple that works really well together. Mm -hmm. And she's like an extremely unjudgmental person, which is always a thing with me when I'm working with people is you're yeah. just trying, you're trying to like be yeah. surrounded with people who give you a wide berth to just experience a lot of, you know, emotions. Yeah, absolutely. So it started being really successful. And then, and then having the kids sit in more regularly, that was something they would do once in a while on the road, like, uh, you know, yeah. in like local-ish Local, market. Yeah. But to suddenly be able to do that regularly and sing different songs. And mm -hmm. then the Q and A with, with the kids where yeah. I would have them answer to do. I mean, I, it became my favorite year of touring that I've ever had, you mm -hmm. know? because I felt like I was working a lot. I was writing new shows every day. I was stimulated yeah. artistically, but I also was like doing it with my favorite people on yeah. the planet and then tucking the little ones in and they were able to kind of see the work that I do. And yeah. I was able to finally let Kirsten into this world in a way that I probably had kept her at arm's length for, mm -hmm. you know, 20 plus years. And yeah. so it, in so many ways, it was my favorite tour I've ever done, you know, and I'm, and that's why I'm sort of struggling to like, go back to plexiglass walls and yeah. Frankie sound engineers and somebody, you know, billing me for a draft of beer. You're just like, this is also yeah. Ugh, yeah. Like after, after being with like the greatest venue in the world, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know the transition. And I feel bad saying that too, because everybody keeps going, oh, it must feel so good to play for people again. And I'm like, well, I was always playing for people. It was yeah. just like the best little audience you can imagine. Yeah. You know? yeah. Plus all of everybody who was tuned in, I felt yeah. them. I didn't, yeah, you know. definitely. And, and you don't have to worry about people talking over you while you're trying to play music. Good Lord, that yeah. shit is driving me. I don't know how I'm gonna, I have, I am like, I have like bat ears at this point. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know that I'm being totally reasonable, but I have, it's been rough to even be back out amongst very great, the audiences were great. Yeah. Two, two of the three audiences that I played to so far, but like, just like a guy who kept whispering to his wife throughout the whole show. And it was like, every time I'd be in some like thoughtful moment, it just be like I all I would think is like I guess I'm not enough to get your attention right yeah. now. Like you can't give me your attention for this yeah. four minutes. Well, it's just so exhausting. Like exactly, you know? and and why why do they go if they just want to sit and talk? You can sit and talk somewhere else. Like I I've never understood that, but you know. Well, I love I love that about the streaming shows though. I yeah. mean, it, it was never I never I just played, and the right. downside is I told a lot of jokes too, and you're like. Was that funny? I have no idea. Like, you never know. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I my favorite part of playing live shows, again, is the storytelling and being able to yeah. realize things that you were, like, suspected might be a good story end up being mm -hmm. really well-received. And you're like, oh, fun. So yeah. we'll get used to it again. But it, yeah. it, the stuff you're talking about is very real. Yeah. 